A few years ago, my family decided to go on a grand adventure. Our primary destination was the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. We camped there for two nights and had a blast. We walked along the rim, drove our Jeep out to Point Sublime. Okay, I'm getting really hungry. And the kids rode the mules along the canyon's rim. That's when I decided I would take a little saunter down into the old canyon. Just a mile or two. How hard could that be? Well, not too hard going down. Scenery's pretty. In fact, it's awesome. Well, it's getting a little warm. I better head back up. Geez, it's a little steeper than I remember. A little longer, too. What's the altitude here? 8,200 feet? Jeez. I had only traveled about a mile down into the canyon, and it was killing me. I had gotten only a glimpse of what lay ahead, but that was enough for me to hear the call of the canyon. That was when I decided I would be back and I would backpack the Grand Canyon. Why do people visit the Grand Canyon? Well, it's world famous. Everyone's heard of the Grand Canyon. In fact, sometimes it seems like everyone is here at the Grand Canyon, looking down off the rim. It takes a lot more effort and determination to get to the bottom. Why would anyone want to do such a thing? You know, Grand Canyon was always some place I wanted to go, I guess ever since I was a kid, you know, watching travel logs and reading about it in National Geographic and, and uh, uh, publications like that. So uh, when the opportunity finally came available, I jumped at the chance. It's a challenge. I wanted to do it. I didn't think I could. After visiting the realm, um, I thought uh, I need to go down in there and see what it's like from in, inside of the canyon. And uh, it was fantastic. Now I've already told you why I wanted to go to the canyon. So I'll tell you a little about what to expect in this video. You won't see a lot of me because I'm usually behind the camera. Lucky you. Now we're not gonna talk about geology or the history of the Grand Canyon. We just don't have time. We're going to talk a lot about equipment and logistics. So if you just want to look at the gorgeous scenery, go to the sections describing the trails. So, where do you want to hike? Let's get oriented first. For this video, the Grand Canyon is divided into two starting points, the South Rim and the North Rim. A huge number of people visit the South Rim and look down at one of the most popular trails and campgrounds. Doesn't look too hard, does it? This doesn't look too bad. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, it looks deep and stuff, but it's you don't really see how vast and how deep it is until you're down there. You know, it's just, you can't even fathom it until you're down there. We will take the corridor trails, the South Kaibab, the Bright Angel, and the North Kaibab. They're named the corridor trails because they are the main routes or corridors for hiking into the canyon. The classic beginner hike is to go down the South Kaibab Trail losing almost 4,800 feet in altitude and about seven knee-crunching miles to the Bright Angel Campground to spend the night. Then back up the Bright Angel Trail about four and a half miles and 1,300 feet up to Indian Garden Campground for the next night. The next day, you continue up the Bright Angel Trail another four and a half miles, gaining about 3,000 feet elevation, and then you're out at the Bright Angel Lodge. The north to south hike is a less traveled route. Is it harder than the others? Yeah, yeah, I had prepared myself mentally for a hard hike, and, and, and so I did a lot of training, and I think it really paid off, uh, especially in the ascent on the, on the last two days. 
You hike down the North Kaibab Trail, spend the night at Cottonwood Campground after traveling almost seven miles and dropping down 4,200 feet. You'll sleep well that night. The next day, you will hike seven fairly easy miles. You'll lose only 1,500 feet elevation as you travel to Bright Angel Campground. After that, you'll spend the next day or two hiking out the Bright Angel Trail through Indian Garden as we discussed earlier. If you have time, try to spend a couple of nights at Bright Angel Campground. There's a lot to do and see in the area. Phantom Ranch is just up the trail. That means cold lemonade, or beer, and a hot home cooked meal. If you're in better shape and have more time, try the North Rim to South Rim hike, but you can only do this from mid-May to mid-October. And remember, the summer can be deadly. I mean really deadly. You still interested? So now what? Smile. Okay, hi. <laughs> Here is some essential information that you need to know before starting a hike on any trail. You need to know where you are and where you are going. For that, you need a map or a GPS. I prefer a map for the Grand Canyon because maps don't need batteries, and it's easy to navigate on the trails that we are discussing. Get the 7.5 minute scale maps for the detail that you need to know exactly where you are on the trail. As you hike down the trail, glance at the map occasionally to verify where you are on the trail. If you carry a GPS, Bring along a map as a backup. Carry enough water containers to keep you hydrated on the longest section of a trail with no water sources. Gotta have water. Drink a lot of water. And I'm not a big water drinker, but I drink a lot of water. I can't remember ever consuming as much water as I did from rim to rim. It's uh, an incredible amount of water and uh, I needed every bit of it. It is important that you have a way to purify the water that you get from a natural source. I use a water filter and also add a couple of drops of chlorine to each one liter bottle. You should carry some type of water purification system even if you plan on getting water in the campgrounds. Sometimes the water system can break down. At least carry some iodine tablets for an emergency situation. You should pack clothing that offers layers of protection. For instance, start with a lightweight shirt next to your body. Follow that with a light insulating jacket. A windbreaker over this will block out any chilling breeze. And finally, for sitting around camp, a down parka will keep you toasty. Carry either a rain suit or a poncho. This is an essential item. You can't afford to get wet and chilled. All of your clothing should be of a wicking material. Do not wear cotton except in the middle of the summer. Wool and synthetics are the way to go. This includes gloves and socks also. I carry three pairs of wool socks. Unlike cotton, wool clothing will keep you warm even if it gets wet. An important tip. In cold weather, have a pair of socks for sleeping. Use them only for sleeping. That way you won't end up with a smelly sleeping bag. Carry enough food for your hike plus an extra day. This is in case you have some sort of emergency. Like everything else that you are carrying, the weight of the food is important. So think light, dehydrated and freeze dried. There are several companies that produce really good freeze-dried meals. If you want to save money, go to your grocery store and look in the instant rice section. There are dozens of choices of rice and noodle dinners. Make sure that they don't take more than 10 minutes to cook. Just add a little protein to the mix and you've got a complete meal. There are several brands of packaged tuna and chicken that don't require refrigeration and are very light. Plan on carrying at least two pounds of food per person per day. If you coordinate with your hiking partners, you can save some weight. The trip to the canyon, we had three people and we would, uh, each dinner was uh, sponsored by one of the, one of the three people. And uh, this, is, this is a great way to do it because uh, you can uh, divide it up. Uh, 
plus they would do the cooking and uh, we only have to take one stove so uh, I highly recommend more than one person go to the canyon you can divide all this uh, all the food up and the stove and uh, the lighting and so forth a critical part of the food supply are snacks that you can nibble on as you hike your body is constantly losing water as you hike along with the water you're losing electrolytes. Those are salts and minerals that your body needs to function properly. To prevent this, have a snack of something salty every time you stop to take a drink and at least once every hour. There are also drink supplements that can help maintain your electrolyte levels. Most people are now carrying headlamps with LEDs. Be sure to take extra batteries. If you carry a traditional flashlight, also carry extra bulbs. This is your tent, tarp, or at the very least, an emergency blanket, sometimes called a space blanket. There are many different styles of tents and differing philosophies on those styles. The heaviest piece of gear uh, was probably my two-man tent. Uh, I, I'm rather claustrophobic with a one-man tent, and uh, I, had, uh, I had room to spread out, and. Uh, uh, it, it weighed probably twice as much as a uh, uh, normal backpack tent, but uh, I, that's one, one article I sacrificed uh, to carry with me. Well, I took an ultralight single wall tent. It was made out of this uh, silicon coated nylon, which was extremely thin fabric, but uh, extremely um, uh, tough. And uh, this particular tent that I, I uh, took uh, used incorporated my hiking pole as a support, so that was just another, uh, a few ounces of weight eliminated from my pack. I didn't have to take uh, a pole uh, and just use my hiking pole for this tent. It was just a simple wedge design tent, but it served me well. You'll need to experiment to see what type of tent matches your style of hiking. Just a word of caution using stakes in the canyon. You would be surprised how hard the dirt is in the campgrounds. After my first trip, I tied loops of cord in the stake loops of my tent so that I could use large rocks to anchor the tent. Be sure that if you move rocks, you put them back where they came from when you leave. To keep warm in your shelter, you need a sleeping bag and a pad. In warm weather, you can substitute a light cover for the sleeping bag. Make sure that your bag is rated for the coldest weather that you expect to encounter on your trip. You need a lighter or matches to light your camp stove or candle lantern. Open fires are not allowed anywhere in the inner canyon. My favorite type of backpacking stove is the butane canister type. It's easy to assemble and extremely easy to light. Of course, you also need a pot to cook in and eating utensils. You must pack out any food packages and scraps of food left over from your meals. Hiking poles or a hiking stick can really save your knees going downhill in the Grand Canyon. They saved my ankles on several occasions. There are lots of ankle breakers on all of the trails. One of my daughter's friends said that poles were for old people. Well, after the hike we took, she was limping and I wasn't, so there. Poles can be useful for other purposes, too. Feels water. <laughs> At the very least, buy a small first aid kit to carry with you. I make my own kit with items that I feel would be especially helpful for me. Be sure to pack any medicine that you take on a regular basis. This is especially important out here. A good hat and sunglasses are essential. Sunscreen will also be helpful if you're fair skinned. Yeehaw! <laughs> I always carry a multi-tool in my pocket and have used it on every trip. I also carry duct tape wrapped around a small pencil and big safety pins. To carry all this gear, you need a backpack. Make sure that it fits you correctly and you know how to adjust it. Let someone you know and trust of your hiking plans. They should understand your route and your expected return date. If you say you will call them when you get out, make sure that you do. You don't want an unnecessary search started just because you forgot to make a call.
Many people don't know that to camp below the rim of the canyon, you have to obtain a permit from the Grand Canyon Backcountry Office. These are sometimes very hard to get because the National Park Service restricts the number of people camping below the rim. On the trails that we are discussing, you can only camp in designated areas. Here's how you fill out the permit request form. We'll start with the South Kaibab to Bright Angel route. Complete the personal information area, including the number of people camping. If you are renting a car for travel to the canyon, just write rental in the car license area. The best spot to leave your car on the south rim is at the backcountry parking area, also called parking lot E. Now fill out the dates and areas that you want to camp. In this case, two nights at Bright Angel and one night at Indian Garden. You can fill in alternative dates or campsites in case the campgrounds are full. And believe me, they fill up quickly. Now fill out the credit card information. Backcountry camping costs $8 per night per person, plus a $10 permit fee. You also pay $30 per car at the entrance to the park. Write the credit card number, expiration date, your signature, and a short note stating authorized to charge and the amount it will cost. In this case, $40. The recommended way to send your permit is by faxing it. The backcountry office will accept permits four months prior to the month that you plan your trip. For instance, for a trip in October, fax your permit on June 1st. If you faxed a few days before this, your permit will be mixed randomly with those that arrived on the 1st. It's like a mini lottery. The permit allows you to stay in the campground that you selected. It does not reserve a particular spot in that campground. If you want a particular campsite, you just have to be the first one there. In three weeks or so, if you were successful, you will receive a letter by mail. It's like being a kid at Christmas time when you receive it. And if you didn't get the permit, it's like getting all those college rejection letters. <sighs> Always check with your physician before starting any type of exercise program. When you begin training, start slowly. It's going to take some time to work up to the level of fitness that you need. Above all, it takes one thing to be ready for a hike in the canyon. I forget the word. What am I looking for? The word. Um, physical conditioning? Yes. Physical conditioning. Each person needs to customize their own physical training program for their own level of fitness. Well, I lifted weights, but I also uh, 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 did stair climbing and then also just hiking on, on some trails around here and, and while they weren't so high, I found some steep ones and I'd go up and down three or four times in an afternoon just to try to uh, develop my leg strength. Since you're going to be hiking, walking exercises need to be a part of your program. I did a lot of walking. I was walking about four miles a day, but I wasn't really using going up and down hills. Um, I did a little bit of um, inclining on the treadmill, walking backwards. Um, not a whole lot. I never put my pack on to walk, but, but walking was basically what I did. I didn't run. Did a little Stairmaster, but that's about it. Did it get you ready for it? No. <laughs> you can be as creative as you want to be. I uh, have a treadmill and I put it on 10% grade. I put uh, 40 pounds of kitty litter in my backpack and walked uh, at least 30 minutes at uh, three miles an hour each night with that for, I know for three or four months. And uh, uh, it, uh, <laughs> I think it helped in the long run. One thing to keep in mind, the Park Service says that to hike to the river and back up in one day is the equivalent of running a marathon. They do not recommend this. But it gives you an idea of the physical demands that are needed to hike successfully and safely in the Grand Canyon. So what's the weather like in the summer in the Grand Canyon? The weather's hot. It's hot. It's just amazingly hot. There you go. It's hot. There's also a huge difference between the temperature at the top of the canyon and the bottom. 
You can expect the temperature at the bottom to be between 20 and 30 degrees warmer than at the top. Here are some average highs at Phantom Ranch. Compare those with the average highs at the South Rim. Now the temperatures can be much higher or lower. When you're planning your trip, check the weather and follow the basic principle of hope for the best, prepare for the worst. In addition to temperatures, the chance of precipitation is another weather factor to consider. The monsoon season usually starts in July and runs through the first part of September. Yes, this is a desert, but there are monsoons. In Arizona, that means thunderstorms with lightning and the potential for flash floods. Don't think that because you're on well-developed trails that you won't be affected by these weather conditions. People have been killed near Indian Garden by a flash flood. If you ever hear a huge rumbling sound coming toward you, immediately take off your backpack, drop it, and scramble as high as you can up the side of the canyon. You may only have seconds to save your life. Now the odds of this happening are extremely remote, so don't worry too much. You're more likely to be struck by lightning. Now don't get freaked out by this either. If you hear thunder, immediately assess your situation. You do not want to be on an exposed ridge, and you definitely do not want to be the tallest object around. Get away from the ridge if you can. Take off your backpack, since it could have metal supports in it, leave your poles with the backpack, and get at least 30 feet away. Have your hiking partners spread out with at least 30 feet between each person. If you bunch together, several of you could be struck at once. Crouch on the ground with your feet close together and your hands on your knees. A common mistake people make is to seek cover under a rock overhang or even a cave. This is a bad idea. If lightning strikes above you, that overhang will work just like a giant spark plug. And guess who gets sparked? If you are flying, the two closest major airports to the Grand Canyon are at Phoenix and Las Vegas. There are small airports at Flagstaff and Tucson near the South Rim, and a small airport in St. George, Utah on the north side of the park. Of course, flying into these small airports can more than double the cost of your airline ticket. I usually fly into Phoenix, then take Interstate 17 North 150 miles to Flagstaff. From Flagstaff, you continue to either the South Rim, which is 79 miles away, or to the North Rim, which is a 207 mile trip. The North Rim Road is closed from about mid-October to mid-May. Now, back to Flagstaff. There are two routes to the South Rim. The main route is to follow Interstate 40 west to Williams, then take 64 north the rest of the way. A less traveled route is to take Highway 180 out of Flagstaff, which connects to 64 at Valley. I like this route because it's more scenic, but it may take longer because of the curves. Don't take this road if there's a chance of a snowstorm. Traveling by car to the South Rim from Las Vegas, you can cross the Hoover Dam, which I don't recommend because of the traffic. It may be faster to go through Bullhead City and then on to Interstate 40 to Williams and then up Highway 64. To get to the North Rim, take Interstate 15 to St. George, Utah. Then follow a series of secondary roads to Jacob Lake. There are also shuttles and buses that run from Phoenix and Las Vegas to the Grand Canyon. The Trans Canyon Shuttle Company travels between the North Rim and the South Rim from mid-May to mid-October or until the North Rim Road closes. Be sure to make reservations in advance. Unless you want to drive an hour or so, stay either in Tucson or in the park the night before you hike. I have always stayed in one of the lodges on the South Rim before I hiked. There are several to choose from, from the pricey El Tovar to the economical but pleasant Maswick. Staying here the night before your hike is a good idea. The altitude at the South Rim is about 7,000 feet. This surprises a lot of people. The Native Americans who lived in this area named the area Mountain Lying Down. When you look down off the rim, you can see why. An extra night's rest gives your body a chance to adjust to the elevation. I feel slightly lightheaded when I walk around the South Rim on the first day. Some people feel fine. This is a good chance to get a look at the canyon. There's some great views along the rim walk. There are cafeterias in the Maswick and Yavapai lodges, 
and restaurants in the Bright Angel and El Tovar Lodges. My two favorite restaurants are the Arizona Room and the Bright Angel Restaurant, both in the Bright Angel Lodge. The Bright Angel Lodge also has a small bar just off the lobby, which is fun to hang out in. It also opens early in the morning with the first coffee and bagels available in the area. If you get up early like me, you'll appreciate that. The store at the Market Plaza is a good place to stock up on anything you might have forgotten while packing. It has a full grocery store, liquor shop, sandwich shop, and camping store all in one. On the North Rim, the Grand Canyon Lodge has a number of cabins that you can stay in. There are three restaurants on the North Rim, all clustered in the lodge complex. All of them are good. There's also a small grocery store next to the campground. One time when I hiked from the north to the south, I decided that I would get a backcountry permit and sleep near the junction of the Ken Patrick and Uncle Jim Trail. You have to walk a mile or so from the North Kaibab Trail to be in the allocated area for your backcountry permit, but it's worth it. Now this was the middle of May. You can see how much cooler and how much more snow the North Rim gets than the South Rim. Be sure to hang your food in this area. There are lots of hungry animals on the North Rim. There are also mountain lions in this region. So if you're camping alone, be cautious, particularly at dawn and at dusk. I know I was a little spooked. The best way to get to the South Kaibab Trailhead is by taking a park shuttle bus. You cannot leave your car at the trailhead. There is a special Hikers Express shuttle bus that leaves as early as 4 a.m. in the summer. This bus stops at the Bright Angel Lodge and at the Backcountry Information Center, then travels directly to the trailhead. If you are hiking from May through September, you better be on the 4 a.m. bus Otherwise, you will encounter some dangerously high temperatures later. The Bright Angel Trailhead is near the Bright Angel Lodge. If you drove a car, the best place to park is at the Backcountry Information Center, parking lot E. You can then walk over to the trailhead. On the North Rim, the North Kaibab Trailhead is about one and a half miles from the lodge. If you drove your car, you can park in the lot at the trailhead. If you caught a ride with someone and stayed at the lodge, check with the desk for shuttle service or you can hike to the trailhead if you want. If you have taken the Trans Canyon Shuttle from the South Rim, check with the driver for rates and their scheduled departure from the lodge in the morning. If you've camped in the campground, it's a short hike to the trailhead and is a good time to loosen up before your descent. Even though this is one of the corridor trails, the South Kaibab Trail is not one to be taken lightly. The most critical point is there's no water available anywhere on the trail. This means for almost seven miles, you'll have to carry all the water that you need. In the winter, when I like to hike, I carry at least three full liters of water, sometimes a little more. This is just enough to get me to the water faucet near the junction of the South Kaibab and the Bright Angel Trails at the bottom. Personally, I was glad I took more water than I thought I would need, and I drank every bit of it. I would rather, as far as weight's concerned, cut down and, and not take other, other equipment, but have plenty of water, take that extra water bottle. The National Park Service does not recommend that you hike this trail in the summer unless you plan to finish your hike before 10 a.m. The temperature increases dramatically as you descend, and it can be easily 50 degrees warmer when you end than when you started. This is fine in the winter, but in the summer, you could find yourself in a dangerous heat situation. The top of the South Kaibab has a lot of foot traffic and is very worn and smooth. In the winter, it can be glazed over with ice and snow. Between November and March, I carry these lightweight instep crampons. They add just enough traction to keep you from slipping. If you want to get something bigger, you can get a set like these, 
but you probably won't need them on the South Kaibab or the Bright Angel Trails. Now there's a chance that you would need them on the North Kaibab in the middle of the winter. I'll show you where later. As you head down the trail, remember to drink a little water and have a small salty snack at least every hour. Just stop and pull your pack off when you start to feel tired. Give it 10 minutes and start again and it'll be like you're starting all over uh, from the very beginning. It's incredible what a 10 minute break will do for you. Take energy food, eat a lot of energy food. Don't think about a diet going into the Grand Canyon. You'll appreciate the breaks when you finish your hike. If you don't take breaks, you could exhaust yourself. This is when injuries can happen. It happened to me on the Hermit Trail when I was rushing to beat sundown. Look up the term face plant. I've learned to slow down and rest frequently. If you do the same, you will enjoy your hike a lot more. The first significant overlook is called Ua Point. You'll see why when you get there. It's about a mile down the trail. At this point, you'll know why you train so hard. Ua offers a magnificent view of the canyon. You can also see your first restroom stop on the trail at Cedar Ridge. It's about one and a half miles from the trailhead. This is a steep part of the trail, so take it easy and use those hiking poles. The restrooms at Cedar Ridge are pit toilets. In other words, they don't flush. But don't worry, they're really not that bad and are a lot better than trying to find a private spot on the side of the trail. Cedar Ridge is a good place to take a long break Look around and enjoy the scenery. You may be surprised at the amount of activity here. This is a popular turnaround point for day hikers. I've seen lots of people come down here for just a short visit. The animals are accustomed to people visiting here and accidentally dropping scraps of food. Consequently, they are very aggressive. Now don't throw rocks or harass the animals. They're just trying to survive. Also, you can get a big fine if you do. Just move your pack away. From this point on, the South Kaibab follows the ridge, so the view is great. As you move on down the trail, you pass beneath O'Neill Butte, which was named for a soldier who served with Teddy Roosevelt. You'll be doing your own version of rough riding at this point as the trail bumps on down to Skeleton Point. Near here, you'll get an awesome view of the Tonto and a heart-stopping view of the trail that you have to take to make it down. I knew it would be hard. It was uh, not as hard as I anticipated, though. Uh, I got myself in reasonable shape when I, uh, before I went. Actually, the downhill was more strenuous than the uphill to me. You'll also get your first view of the Colorado River. Depending on the amount of rainfall upstream, the river will be either a bright green or a dark reddish brown. Either color, it's an inspirational sight. It might be a good time to rest here since this part of the trail is not easy. It's steep and has lots of loose rock that can twist your ankle if you're not careful.
Finally, you wind down the slope of the Tonto to the area called the tip-off, presumably because you could tip something off the edge and it would go all the way to the Colorado River. Don't try it, there are people down there. Here, you'll get another great indoor bathroom experience to relate to your grandchildren. There is also an emergency telephone to call for help. Now the telephone here is for reporting life-threatening situations, not blisters on my feet, I'm hot, and I just don't like this type of emergencies. If you're hot and are tired enough, you can try to catch some shade beside the toilets. The smell's not great, but at least you can get out of the sun. I ate lunch here with 10 other hikers one hot March day. Now that's a bunch of hardcore hikers. After the tip-off, it's another two miles and 1,500 feet down to the Colorado. This may be the hardest part of the hike. You're probably tired and anxious to get to the campground. Yes, because you can see the bottom, but it seems like you never get there. You just keep going and going and going, and you're getting sore and sore and more sore. <laughs> Take it nice and slow. You don't want to trip or fall here. At this point, you may get some encouragement from other hikers. He was just all, oh, you know, you're almost there now. Well, we weren't almost there. Uh, I was thinking, this has got to end soon. This has got to end soon. We got to get there. <laughs> Finally, a nice little surprise just before the Kaibab or Black Bridge. Woohoo, it's like Disneyland. If you're nervous about walking in the dark, you may want to have your headlight ready. It's not very long and you're out on the bridge. What a feeling. It can be inspirational and life-changing. The first time I saw the river and I saw the rafters, I said, I gotta do that. Going on my second rafting trip this April, and the first one was unbelievable. Probably the greatest trip I've done. It's only another half mile up the trail from here to Bright Angel Campground. You'll pass some ruins that are about 700 years old, and the grave of a worker killed here while building one of the bridges. Don't move any of these stones or walk into any of these sites. You'll pass Boat Beach. This is where river runners stop before continuing on down the Colorado. Don't be tempted to swim in the river here, or anywhere else for that matter. Several people have drowned at this site. The river is extremely cold and the currents can be treacherous. The walk down this part of the trail can be hard because a good bit of it is deep sand. Just be comforted that just around the bend is shade, water, and restrooms with flushing toilets. You're probably feeling pretty cocky right now. We made it! Yes. But then reality sets in, and you realize that even though you've made it to the bottom, you still have to get out. That's a scary feeling when you don't when you're so sore and you're thinking, I'll never get out of here. All right. 
You made it to Bright Angel Campground, you've rested overnight, and you're ready to go, right? The morning after the day I hiked down was unbelievably painful. I could barely stand up, but it got better as the day went on. Take it easy today. Do some stretches and light walking. This is why I recommend two nights here if you're a beginner hiker. The campsites at Bright Angel Campground are all on the west side of Bright Angel Creek, just inside Bright Angel Canyon. You have to cross the footbridge to enter the campground. The cottonwoods are a welcome shade from the desert sun and are a beautiful bright yellow in the fall. The most popular sites are by the stream. You have to get there early to grab one of these. There are picnic tables at each site and poles to hang your backpacks. There are also food storage boxes for your food. You should also place anything in here that might have a pleasant smell to an animal. Things like toothpaste and lotion. Hang your backpack high enough so that the deer can't reach it. You may see a lot of deer and other animals here. Don't approach or try to feed any of the animals. This is not a petting zoo. These are wild animals, and you aren't going to do them any favors by feeding them. Beside that, it's against the law. And there's a chance you may be injured if the animal gets nervous and attacks you. Also, don't hang clothes or attach your tent to the shrubs and trees growing next to your campsite. It could damage the plants, then campers would have even less privacy. The restrooms here are not the composting types found in the other campgrounds. These have flushing toilets and sinks with running water. There is also a utility sink outside which is good for rinsing dirty dishes and clothes. This campground will not provide you a wilderness camping experience. The sites are close together and there may be a lot of other characters, I mean campers, with you. Oh, the weirdest thing. Um, it would have to be that guy with the banana walking through our campground. He came through holding a banana peel going, what should I do with this? What should I do with this? He couldn't find a trash can. That was the thing. There are no trash cans because they don't want people dumping their trash. He just walked through campsites with no flashlight. <laughs> It was pitch black. He came wandering through campsites, holding a banana peel, going, what should I do with this? It was bizarre. It was kind of freaky. You'll have lots of memories and lots of stories to tell from your journey down the South Kaibab. And that is only the beginning. Most people hike out to the South Rim by the Bright Angel Trail. Even though it's about two and a half miles longer than the South Kaibab Trail, it has several characteristics that make it an easier hike. First, there are plenty of places to get water. The Colorado River, just before you turn up Pipe Spring Canyon, Pipe Spring itself in several areas. Indian Garden has several water faucets in the camping area and along the trail. Finally, as you head up, there's water at both Three Mile Rest House and Mile and a Half Rest House. The fact that the trail is not as steep as the South Kaibab also makes it an easier hike. Plus, you can camp at Indian Garden if you want to break the hike up into two days. Some people may say that this is silly since it's only a 9.6 mile hike out, but there's some interesting sights to see around Indian Garden. You start your hike by heading toward the river from the campground. Take the small bridge which crosses the Bright Angel Creek. There is a small restroom with flushing toilets here if you want to take a quick break before heading up the trail. You'll cross the silver bridge, then turn to your right. A left turn would take you back to the South Kaibab Trail and the Black or Kaibab Bridge. You'll encounter lots of sand on this section of the trail. It can make for some tough hiking and can be extremely hot in the summer. If you are hiking from May through September, it is critical to reach Indian Garden by 10 a.m. The temperatures can reach dangerous levels on this trail. Mm -hmm. 
Just before you turn up Pipe Creek Canyon, you can take a last look at the Colorado River. Be careful as you stand near the river. Even though this is not even classified as a rapid, it's called a riffle, several people have drowned here. Don't get in the water. Just up this canyon is a small rest house with an emergency telephone. As you head uphill and away from the noise of the river, the canyon closes in on you and the hike becomes very quiet and peaceful. But don't relax too much. You're coming up to the dreaded Devil's Corkscrew. In the summer, it is crucial to be out of this area before the direct sunlight hits you. The temperatures can be brutal and deadly. I knew what to expect from the heat. I had walked to Phantom Ranch in the middle of the summer before, and uh, I knew what to expect as far as the heat was concerned. Uh, but um, I'm much older now, so it affected me a little more than it did when I was in my 20s. Uh, so it, uh, it was a different feeling. This part of the trail is steep, and it seems like the switchbacks are never going to end. Finally, they do, and you can pat yourself on the back for making it this far. Just up the trail from here, I was surprised by this large group of condors. I think everyone was surprised that these huge birds were sitting so close to the trail. This type of behavior is not encouraged by the park service and someone quickly shooed them away. They don't want the birds to get accustomed to people. This next section of the trail is one of my favorite parts of the Bright Angel, especially in the fall when the cottonwood trees are changing. My favorite part was just seeing the views. They were just unbelievable and every more hundred feet you'd go, it would be a different view and just incredible colors and just unbelievable. If you listen closely, you might hear the song of a tiny bird, the Canyon Wren. The Canyon Wren was the favorite bird of Ed Abbey, one of my favorite writers about the Southwest. The piece of the trail ends suddenly with the bustle of Indian Garden. This is a popular turnaround point for hikers and mule riders alike, so you'll have plenty of company here. There's also a ranger station staffed year-round in case you need any help. There are restrooms and water faucets scattered around the campground. If you're going to spend the night here, go ahead and find a campsite. Remember, you have to have a permit in advance, otherwise you have to continue on out to the rim. So plan ahead. Even though the hike from the Bright Angel Campground is only about 4.7 miles and about 1,300 feet up, it is surprisingly strenuous. You might want to take a little rest before you do anything else. the campsites at Indian Garden are located on the west side of the trail starting just below the ranger station. Indian Garden I like because they had shelters over the picnic uh, tables and you could get out of the sun in the afternoon when we, when we arrived. It was uh, a larger campground as I recall uh, and I think there were more trees, more shade available there than, than the other two which I liked. Uh, I also liked to be able to go down to the area where the horses were watered and uh, it was just a nice uh, gathering point. Um, it seemed uh, towards the end of the day a lot of the other campers would, would gather there and, and uh, actually met one of the rangers and, and, and had a nice conversation with him that afternoon as the sun was setting. This is a busy area because it's relatively close to the South Rim. Lots of day hikers and mule riders visit this area. I was, uh, Indian Gardens was not what I thought it was going to be. I figured it'd be this plush garden and just a nice creek running through it and uh, 
it looked pretty barren. <laughs> it was pretty barren and it was winter time and nobody was there. There was nobody there. Uh, it looks better in the spring. If you want the most peace and quiet, pick a spot as far to the west as you can. This will place you as far away as possible from the main trail. Personally, I like the sites that are located on the northwest side of the campground. They have the least amount of traffic, are close to the water faucets and restrooms, and have great views of the canyon. A good side trip from Indian Garden is the mile and a half trail to Plateau Point. This is the destination for some mule trips, but if you wait until late afternoon, you should have the place to yourself and maybe a few other hardy souls. If you want to watch sunset from Plateau Point, be sure to take a light with you. You may become caught up with the splendor of the site and forget that it's going to get dark soon. It's no fun stumbling back to camp in the dark on this trail. I speak this with the voice of experience. Although the views everywhere are great, they're just really, really nice at Plateau Point. A lot, a lot of good views. And it's not a hard walk, it's an easy walk. Be very careful while you're at Plateau Point. There are a few guardrails and it's a long way down. The risk is worth it though. The views from here may be some of the most dramatic in the canyon. The most awe-inspiring would be a sunset at the river. It was just incredible. From this viewpoint, several aspects of my canyon trip came into focus for me. This is a place that both inspires and tests people. But here, you don't want to fail the test. You can make a C or a D, but don't make an F. I don't know why this Park Service helicopter was searching the way it was, but I suspect someone may have failed their test. This is not a place to play around. Okay, that's enough lecturing. Enjoy the view. All right, you've rested overnight, had a good meal, and are ready to head out. You race up the trail thinking you've got the hardest part behind you and suddenly realize there's still another 3,000 feet of elevation and 4.9 miles to go. Whoa, that's some serious hiking there. This is a place where you need really good hiking partners. Don't be a whiner. Don't be a whiner. Because uh, you're going you're gonna to go through a lot of uh, challenging spots. You're gonna be hot, you're gonna be tired, your pack's gonna get heavy, and you want someone who can pull their own weight. A couple of miles up the trail, after you've struggled through Jacob's Ladder, you'll hit Three Mile Rest House. I think they named it this just to torment people hiking out. It's three more miles to the top? What? I remember one trip, 
the helicopters, the rangers landed, and, and I actually said, I will pay you $500 right now to fly me out of here. But they said they wish they could do that, but they can't do that. Hike another mile and a half, and guess what? It's mile and a half rest house. There's both water and restrooms here. On an uphill hike like this, you need several forms of nutrition to keep going. You know, uh, particularly in the Grand Canyon, I, I like salty foods uh, because uh, I've perspired so much. I was always craving salt through the entire uh, hiking process. Uh, peanuts were great. Another thing I, I really enjoyed and I took were um, baking chocolate, semi-sweet chocolate squares. And they really gave me a boost of energy on, on the ascents. It may have been psychological, but it gave me a boost. On your way up, stop to enjoy the scenery. You won't see anything like this anywhere in the world. There's a good chance you will be passed by a mule train on the Bright Angel Trail. Don't try to outrun them. They may look slow from a distance, but they're not. Try to get to a wide part of the trail and get to the uphill side of the trail. Don't stand on the downhill side. A mule could accidentally push you off. If the mule wrangler gives you instructions, follow them immediately. He or she knows what they're doing. Don't make loud noises or sudden movements. These mules are extremely well trained, but you don't want to take a chance. When you reach this set of switchbacks, you're getting close to the top, but it's a maddening slow climb. The best thing about this part of the trail is that you have gained a lot of altitude and the temperature has dropped. This is good in the warm season. I've hiked here when it was 10 below. It's really not that bad if you have the correct clothing, really. This part of the trail is full of twists and turns. I'm sure you'll find a surprise around every corner. Near the top of the trail, just like the South Kai bed, the trail is well worn and can be covered in snow and ice in cold weather. Pull out your crampons if you need to. You don't want to spoil your trip this close to the end. When you reach the second tunnel, you're almost out. Congratulations. Get someone to take your picture. But for goodness sake, don't tell everyone you conquered the canyon. It may have just conquered you. I don't know if I'm obsessed, but it's, um, I'm going back in April and it'd be two years since I've been out there and I'm, um, I need to go back. If you want to experience the wilder nature of the Grand Canyon, hike down the North Kaibab Trail. At 14 miles from the rim to Bright Angel Campground, it is a much longer trail than the South Kaibab and the Bright Angel. I wanted to do a rim to rim. Uh, that was uh, an ambition that I had. And uh, 
once I did it, I felt like I really accomplished something. It was fantastic. Far fewer people travel this route, so you won't have as much company as you would on the South Rim trails. From the middle of November to the middle of May, the road to the North Rim is closed. However, you can still hike up the trail and camp on the North Rim in the designated winter camping area. We'll talk about that later. For now, we're going to follow the trail down, as most people do. Why down? Well, the North Rim is about 1,000 feet higher than the South Rim. That extra thousand feet makes a difference. Having not been to the canyon, had never camped, hiked in a canyon before, uh, it was totally different or foreign to any, any other kind of hiking I had done. And I probably uh, wasn't uh, prepared mentally for the, the stress on my knees going down, uh, uh, going down so steeply and, and so long, really all day. So the traditional hike is down the North Kaibab and out the Bright Angel. When we started down the trail, it was 22 degrees on May 12th. Remember this temperature, you'll see why later. You ease down a well-traveled trail through the aspens and firs until you get your first open view of Roaring Springs Canyon at Coconino Overlook. This will be the first of many spectacular views you'll have on this trail. By the Supai Tunnel, 1.7 miles down the trail, you'll be ready for a break. There's a water faucet here and restrooms. Remember to drink some water, have a small salty snack. Because of frequent rock falls in this area, this water may not be working. Check with the backcountry office before you hike down. When we hiked down this trail in May, the hot desert air hit us in the face as soon as we came out of the tunnel, and it never stopped. Remember that 22 degrees a couple of hours ago? Well, it's gone. This section of the trail has several areas that will take your breath away. These views are what make the North Kaibab one of my favorite trails in the canyon. There are parts of the trail in this area that are very steep and rocky. Try not to slip here. Some of the rocks on the trail are very loose. They were doing maintenance on the North Rim Trail and there was some loose dirt and I uh, became a part of it. <laughs> and uh, uh, before I knew it, uh, I was uh, laying on my backpack. Just when you believe you've seen it all, you come upon Roaring Springs. The weirdest thing I've ever seen was the waterfall coming out of a rock. I saw no headwaters for, the, for this waterfall. It was coming out of, it looked like a, um, just a hole in the wall where the water was coming out. This is a magical place where a huge stream burst out of the side of the canyon all year long. This spring supplies the drinking water for the North and South Rim and also for Phantom Ranch. So what's the most popular stop for lunch on the trail? I think probably Roaring Springs. It was a, uh, it was a time of the day where I was ready to take a, a lunch break and, and, and the cool water and just even just visually uh, uh, refresh me, uh, seeing all that water coming out of the cave and, and, and gushing down the uh, canyon wall. 
You have to go down a side trail to get water here. You might want to leave your pack at the top of the trail. It's a pretty steep hill down to the water. There are lots of squirrels and ravens just waiting to get into your food. Make sure your pack is animal proof. If you're not sure, go ahead and take your pack with you. Just below here, Roaring Springs Canyon merges with Bright Angel Canyon and the character of the trail changes again. There's a residence here that was used by the caretaker for the water pumps that feed all of Grand Canyon. Bruce Aiken lived here with his wife and family until he retired not too long ago. Bruce painted in his spare time and has a beautiful portfolio. We were lucky enough to meet Bruce as we hiked through. He's a nice guy, but I think we were more impressed with the shade and the cool water that comes from the faucet in his yard. Like the water at the Supai Tunnel and at Roaring Springs, this is seasonal. It may not be on during the winter. From this point on, you really don't need to worry much about obtaining water because the trail parallels Bright Angel Creek. You do have to worry about the heat since you've dropped down almost 4,000 feet from the trailhead. By the time my hiking partners and I reached Cottonwood Campground, it was 102 degrees. That's an 80 degree difference in six hours. So from the tunnel on down, make frequent stops, drink plenty of water, and don't get overheated. Finally, at about 6.8 miles down the trail, you reach Cottonwood Campground. Many people continue on to Bright Angel Campground another 7.2 miles, but I don't know why. This is a great place to spend the night and you'll need the rest. From the north, you come into Cottonwood Campground down a long sloping section of the North Kaibab Trail. First impression of Cottonwood, I could see it from what I thought was less than a mile and uh, I continued to hike for probably the next hour and thought, wow, this is going to be wonderful if I ever get there. And uh, once I did, uh, there's a stream flowing through and you have canyon walls on both sides and just uh, an incredible feeling since it was our first night in the canyon the sun setting, the different light uh, reflecting off the walls. Just a, it was a wonderful experience, very solemn, very, very nice. I've camped here twice in late March and only saw one person both nights I was here. It will be full of campers from May through October. Campsites are scattered on either side of the trail on the north side of the campground. So if you get to the restrooms, you've passed all the sites. I did like Cottonwood. It seemed more remote. There were, uh, as I recall, fewer campers at Cottonwood than, than we had at, at uh, Bright Angel and, and Indian Garden. Uh, and I thought that the campsites were spaced, they weren't so as close together there. At least there was a lot of foliage so that you felt uh, a, a more of a sense of privacy at that campground than the other two. The sites on the west side of the trail have the best views of the canyon, but are in the direct sun for most of the afternoon. They can be very hot. We saw a couple get into a heated argument over their blistering hot campsite, but it was the last available site. What's a guy to do? Well, to avoid this, try to get here early to grab a shaded site on the east side of the trail. The water faucet is located near the restrooms. The ranger station here has a shaded area nearby with benches. This is a great place to take a nap if you are unlucky enough to get one of the unshaded campsites. To me, Cottonwood feels like a remote outpost in the wilderness. Later on in the evening, the sun was setting and we, we could look almost directly up and see the lodge. It was quite spectacular. 
There are picnic tables and food storage boxes here. Be sure to use the boxes because there are lots of squirrels here and they won't hesitate to get into your supplies. When we arrived at Cottonwood, we noticed another group of hikers wearing mosquito netting over their heads. We wondered why until swarms of gnats crowded around our faces. Be sure to bring either insect repellent or mosquito netting if the weather's warm. Like all the other campsites in the Inner Canyon, there are no trash cans here. You must haul out everything that you brought in. I know it's tempting, but don't discard any trash in the restrooms. That ruins things for everyone that comes along after you. The restrooms seem like a luxury when you're backpacking. That was one of the big surprises of the, of the trip. Uh, they were, uh, I believe they were compost toilets that, uh, uh, very nice. Uh, you know, it, uh, it wasn't the Holiday Inn, but it uh, was more than I expected from a campground in the middle of nowhere. Just as a historical note, this campground was the scene of a large flash flood several years ago, so be aware of the weather conditions around you. You can read about it in Over the Edge, Death in Grand Canyon. When you head south from Cottonwood Campground, it appears that you are in for a serious desert hike. Make sure that you have plenty of water before you leave the camp. Then, another of many surprises from the North Kaibab. You have to cross Wall Creek. Weren't expecting that, were you? Then, another surprise 1.6 miles south of Cottonwood. Ribbon Falls is a cool oasis that is a great place to take a break on what can be a very hot trail. You take a short side trail across this bridge to reach Ribbon Falls. Some people leave their packs here to make the trip easier. Again, as at Roaring Springs, be sure your pack is squirrel proof, and good luck with that. The squirrels were very pesky, and as a matter of fact, I had one eat a hole through my pack at, at Ribbon Falls. I set it down very briefly and was not out of, out of sight of the pack, but when my back was turned, the squirrel very quickly uh, chewed a hole and, and got into some uh, gorp, some trail food that I was consuming as I walked along. And, uh, and later on, on, on the last day coming out, I was actually leaning up against the, uh, the side of the canyon, the wall, Heard something behind my back and a little squirrel sitting on my pack. I mean, it was still strapped to my back. So uh, yeah, they can be very aggressive. You will probably meet a lot of people here. Hikers and mule riders alike trek up here from Phantom Ranch for a pretty long day hike to see the falls. The falls are a lot bigger and more dramatic than they appear from the North Kaibab Trail. Be careful if you climb behind the falls, it's slippery. Near here is Upper Ribbon Falls. It takes about 30 minutes to wind up to this isolated little canyon on a steep, faint path that weaves around the stream that feeds Ribbon Falls. Upper Ribbon Falls is not as spectacular as Ribbon Falls, but there's a secret about this area. There are ruins near here from at least 700 years ago. You can actually see the fingerprints of the person that built these granaries. I can't emphasize strongly enough that you should not step in or handle any of the ruins. They're very fragile and can be destroyed by a simple touch. The Park Service also has a friendly little reminder about the same thing, and they're not kidding. You never know when a backcountry ranger might be patrolling in the area. After the refreshing and inspirational break at the falls, you head down the trail toward Phantom Ranch.
This is a classic desert environment with cactuses, century plants, lizards, and tadpoles. I was surprised to be hiking through almost a swamp on this part of the trail, but there it was. It's really not bad to walk through, just more of a surprise than anything. Finally, you come to your last challenge on the trail if the weather is hot, the box. This extremely narrow and deep part of the trail can be an oven in the summer. 120 degrees or even hotter. The Park Service recommends that you don't hike through here between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in the hot season. To keep cool in this section, soak your shirt, hat, and bandana with water from Bright Angel Creek. I found it very uh, cooling to wet my clothes as I was walking down from Cottonwoods to uh, Phantom Ranch and, and the slow evaporation rate of the cotton really made it much more comfortable. This is one time when cotton clothing could actually save your life. If you have to stop every 15 minutes to put on more water, that's fine. Heat exhaustion or even heat stroke is not a good alternative. The heat is a huge factor. On one trip, I got so hot at one point I had salt dried on my face. Um, that's how much I was sweating and, the, and it's so dry out there that you just don't realize how much you're sweating and how much you, body water you're losing. I hiked through here once when the temperatures were around 100 and I kept comfortable by staying wet. I can't swear that would work at 120 degrees. It was physically exhausting at the end of the day when you'd sit down at your campsite and thought, wow, this is, uh, this is quite a trip. Well, it's not that many miles. Uh, you can do it in a car in a matter of minutes, but uh, to walk it in this heat is just uh, incredible. You will see some interesting animals in this area. This lizard, a chuckwalla, is about a foot long. This frog or toad was an unusual color. I was tying my boots when I spotted it. I thought it was a child's toy at first. I saw a snake swallowing a uh, lizard as I turned one of those sharp curves in, in, the, uh, uh, in the box. And uh, while it was not frightening, it was unusual, it, I was taken aback. If you're lucky, you'll see a Grand Canyon rattlesnake. As you can see, they're not aggressive toward people as long as you leave them alone. Don't touch. Finally, you reach civilization at Phantom Ranch and Bright Angel Campground. Have I mentioned before beer, lemonade, and air conditioning? Phantom Ranch is like a small city at the bottom of the canyon. There are restrooms, telephones, cabins, bunkhouses, and even a restaurant. Many people fall in love with the ranch and come back year after year. My first impression of Phantom Ranch was this is so cool to have this little bitty community down here at the bottom of the canyon. Quaint little cabins and go into the canteen and they've got cold drinks and coffee and beer snacks and a fireplace and it's just it's just great. The canteen is headquarters for the ranch. This is the place hikers in the summer dream of. It was an oasis. I was it was it was welcome after that long day, which was the longest hike and, and, and the temperatures were the hottest that we had experienced on the hike and uh, and I knew that the cantina was open and I could get some of that lemonade and it was really through the box that, that kept me kept me going. I was thinking just a few more miles and I can have this uh, ice and lemonade and uh, sit down inside the, the cool. Try to reserve a place at dinner for your first night in the canyon. Phantom Ranch has great food. The, um, the beef stew, ah, oh, 
It's so good, and they have fresh salad and cornbread. It's just all good. It's real good, all you can eat, too. I usually get the stew dinner, although there's also a steak dinner seating. There are two breakfast seatings. Breakfast is all you can eat and really good. Don't be late. Since everyone with a meal reservation waits until called inside, a large group of people congregates outside the canteen, starting about a half an hour before mealtime. This is a great chance to meet your dining partners and share stories about your adventures getting to the bottom. Finally, the meal bell rings and diners are seated at assigned tables. All the meals are served family style, so be nice to your neighbors if you want seconds. You know, the, the famous Phantom Ranch stew was just absolutely uh, uh, delicious, and it may have been because my appetite was, was so great at that point. Uh, I've actually gone online and, 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 and found uh, the recipe for the stew and cooked it at home, and, and it uh, brings back uh, memories when I eat it. And it's absolutely uh, dead on as far as the spices and everything. It tastes exactly like they served it at Phantom Ranch. Meals are noisy, busy, and fun. I've always had a great time at the canteen. After the last dinner seating, the canteen closes for about an hour. Then it reopens so that guests can order coffee, soft drinks, or you guessed it, beer. But the wonderful thing about Phantom Ranch is well, you can go to happy hour and swap stories with all the other people that are doing the same hike you are. And uh, it's fascinating uh, the different viewpoints that you get on the same hike. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I try to get my meal reservations as soon as I receive my backcountry camping permit. I tried to get a reservation for a meal uh, this April, and I tried back in September, and they were all, so that's like seven months ahead, and they were all booked. It's a very popular place with guests staying at Phantom Ranch and backpackers all trying to get meals at the canteen. So don't be surprised if you can't get a meal reservation. If you don't get one before the trip, you can always check at the transportation desk inside the lobby at the Bright Angel Lodge just before you hike down. Sometimes people cancel at the last minute and you can grab a spot. There's a phone here, but you have to have a calling card or place a collect call to use it. Bathrooms are next to the phone. There are showers here too, but they're only for people staying at the dorms and cabins. A fun thing to do while you're here is to buy a postcard to send to friends or family. It will be marked as having been delivered by mule from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There are also shirts only sold here at the canteen, so if you want your bragging rights, it's a good souvenir to buy. If you want more solitude on your camping trip, try hiking on the North Kaibab Trail up to the North Rim anytime between November and the middle of April. Chances are you may have the campground all to yourself. The winter camping area is a couple of hundred yards behind the general store. In the summer, this is called the group camping area. When filling out your backcountry permit, write in North Rim Winter Camp. Camp only in this area, not in the main campground. You'll know you're in the right spot when you see the toilet that is set up for the winter. As you can see, the snow can get quite deep here in the winter. I was here at the end of March and the snow had just melted. Shaded areas were still covered in snow to a depth of several feet. If you plan to camp here in the winter months, be sure that you are skilled in winter camping techniques. Since the North Rim is a thousand feet higher than the South Rim, the temperatures get much lower and the snowfall much deeper, sometimes several feet in one storm. You may have to bring some snowshoes. You will definitely want to bring some crampons as you hike up to North Kaibab. There may be some significant ice accumulations and you definitely don't want to be slipping on these parts of the trail. This footage was shot in the spring but when I came through in late March, there was still ice on the trail. The biggest concern that I had when I made the trip was where to get water. All of the water faucets from Cottonwood Campground northward are turned off in the winter. Now there's a water pump located on the north rim which is buried below ground so it won't freeze, but nobody could tell me exactly where it was. Well, I found it. When you exit the North Kaibab Trailhead, you will want to stay on the road since the trail through the trees will probably be several feet deep in snow. 
be careful if you have to post hole it out of the snow. The snow can be covered with a hard crust, and if you fell with your foot in the bottom of the step, you could hurt your leg. About a half mile up the road, you'll see a backcountry office sign. Take a right. There will be a small house directly on the right, and behind this house is a small shed. The water pump is mounted on this shed. It's a pretty good distance from here to the campground, so fill up all your bottles. Go back to the main road and continue until you see the campground and winter camp signs. Turn right and follow this road until you reach the general store. Now you won't be completely alone here, even in the dead of winter, so you could get help if you needed it. But don't expect to see too many people. I saw six in two days. The views in the winter are awesome. The air is very clear so you can see for what seems like hundreds of miles. Sunsets are spectacular if a storm isn't coming in. I think it got down to about 20 degrees when I was there, but it warmed up nicely in the daytime. It was a strange feeling to sit alone knowing that a month later hundreds of people would be in the same spot. It was a very relaxing place to be. In fact, I fell asleep at Bright Angel Point and got a nasty sunburn. Don't forget to bring your sunblock even in the winter. At high altitudes like this, the ultraviolet rays shine on through. If you get lonely, there are payphones next to the general store. Call your friends. Next time, maybe they'll come with you. So, you made it out. Are you ready for more? Well, there certainly is a lot more that you can see. After you are comfortable hiking the corridor trails, you might think about the next step up in difficulty. My choices were the Hermit Trail and the Clear Creek Trail. Clear Creek was a, it was a whole different trail. because it's not a lot of up and down. It's going down through washes, up and down through those. You're on the Tonto, and that's real, um, it's different looking. It's different looking. It's, it's cool. There's, you, it's wide open. It's just wide open, and you can see far, and it's a whole different view. The Clear Creek Trail may be a little more sketchy because of the long distance you have to hike between water sources. It's about nine miles across the very hot Tonto. It's also located on the north side of the river, so it's a little more remote. There is one particularly tricky place on the trail. Getting down to Clear Creek is very steep, very scary. It was, uh, it was probably one of the scariest parts that I've ever been on out there, because if you slip, you're, that's it. I mean, there is no room for error there. The Hermit Trail is not quite as long, but it makes up for it with its dramatic and sometimes treacherous elevation drops. The rewards for the journey are great, though. The favorite part of that trip was the beach. It was beautiful. We had the whole beach to ourselves. It was just soft sand, and just we could wash our clothes, get water easy. It was beautiful. Saw the uh, people coming by in the rafts. And we could go over on the boulders and watch them go through the rapids. That was pretty cool.
The camping area at Granite Rapids is the best campsite I've ever had in the Grand Canyon. Both the Clear Creek and the Hermit Trail require substantial levels of both your physical fitness and knowledge about backpacking over long distances in extreme conditions. It's very steep. It's long. There's minimal water. There's not a lot of people if you get into trouble. You know, these trails are, once you get down there, you gotta come back up, and there's no way back up but your feet or rescue, and those are expensive. I'd love to tell you more about these two trails, but that's for another time. I've gotta plan my next hike. Happy trails, hikers. I'll see you in the canyon. It's good to get up to the top, but at the same time, you just wanna wish you were back down there and could just stay longer. Why? Because it's the canyon. I want to be with the canyon and be one with the canyon. Uh, be inside the canyon and, and feel the full experience of it. You can't really find something like that uh, anywhere else. And, and uh, uh, I think uh, was it Theodore Roosevelt said it was the one place where every American should see, visit once in their life. And he was absolutely correct.